Welcome to today's seminar, which is with Ben Lee Volk, uh, who's at the University of Texas at Austin. Ben has done a lot of nice work in computational complexity theory, in particular in algebraic complexity theory, and he will tell us about some of the latest news today. Please, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I gave a sort of a general title in, in um, which means that, especially in the second hour, we can <laughs> talk about many things, but there is something specific I will, I will tell about. Uh, I, I, I start with a general background complexity theory, and the reason for doing it is not because I think you don't know that. I assume if people came to this seminar, they would know the things I'm saying. Uh, the reason for doing that is that uh, many of those things have uh, analogs in this mirror universe of algebraic complexity theory. So it's sometimes good to um, uh, you know, state the obvious just so we can better appreciate the fact that uh, uh, there are algebraic analogs. Uh, so complexity in theory in general, one way you can describe it is uh, we study how many resources are required for solving problems. Uh, and resources, you know, we can, we know we can be, they can be many things like time, how much time the algorithm needs to run, a space, how, how much memory the algorithm, the algorithm needs. A randomness is also a resource. We can ask, I mean, randomness needs to come from somewhere and we can ask how many bits, how many random bits the algorithm needs or maybe it doesn't need any random bits uh, and so on. Uh, the standard model of computation in complexity theory is just a computer, which we all use now. Uh, formally, you can think about Turing machine or Boolean circuits, uh, Turing machine in the RAM model. They're all uh, different models uh, which have some important differences, but uh, the common things is that they are devices that uh, manipulate bits. The input is represented as a sequence of, sequence of bits and they do some computation, which uh, is described by some local operation on the bits, and then they give the answer, the answer which is also encoded uh, as bits. Uh, and once we have the models, we do things like uh, classifying problems into different complexity classes. Uh, we uh, do reduction between problems, so our reduction between problem A and problem B is just an efficient way of transforming instances of problem A to instances of problem B. So that if B is easy to solve, then A is also easy to solve. Uh, and we want to prove uh, upper and lower bound on those resources. So upper bounds are usually efficient algorithms, whether they run very fast or use very little memory. Uh, and lower bounds are of course proofs that any algorithm needs a certain amount of time or a certain amount of space. Uh, and as you well know, we are much better in proving uh, upper bounds than proving lower bounds, uh, generally speaking. Uh, the flagship problem is, of course, of complexity theory is, of course, P versus NP. Uh, and as I said, this talk will be about this mirror universe of algebraic complexity. In particular, we will state the, an algebraic P versus NP problem. Uh, which is uh, the main uh, open problem in algebraic complexity theory. Uh, all right, so let's, uh, uh, let's state what is algebraic complexity. And before we give uh, uh, definitions of anything, we will just say, uh, analogously, we study the resources that are required for solving algebraic problems using algebraic uh, uh, devices of computation. So, uh, Maybe uh, let's give some examples of algebraic problems before again we we make any definitions. Uh, just so we can see how important they are. So matrix multiplication is an example of algebraic problem. We are given two, uh, let's say two n by n matrices, and we want to compute their product. Uh, so uh, yeah, of course, there's no way to to uh, overstate the importance of matrix multiplication. Uh, Another example is a, a discrete Fourier transform. Uh, so I, I didn't write the exact formula because uh, there's some annoying thing with roots of unity, but a discrete Fourier transform is just uh, some linear transformation of the input, right? It's a, it's a linear transformation from n bit 
uh, from n uh, length n vectors, sorry, there are no bits, from length n vectors to uh, length n vectors, uh, which uh, you can write down. Uh, and of course, also very important uh, in uh, areas like uh, signal processing, but also for large by problems like polynomial multiplication and in integer multiplication. Um, another example is the determinant. So uh, the determinant of an n by n matrix is this polynomial that I wrote here. It's uh, sum over all permutation. And then there's plus or minus one, uh, depending on, on the... Uh, sign of the permutation and then you take the product of the elements on the diagonal and the determinant is of course very important in computations in linear algebra uh, in combinatorics things like that uh, and uh, this is a, a little bit less well known but the, the determinant has a, a, as an evil cousin which is called the, the permanent and the permanent is very similar to the determinant except there are no signs so the sign is always a plus one and the permanent, as I said, it's less well known, but uh, well, in this audience, probably people know it. It comes up in combinatorics. Um, even in, in quantum mechanics, there is some there are determinants and permanents going on. They describe the, the laws for uh, some elementary particles. Uh, anyway, these are all examples of uh, algebraic problems that we, wa we might want to compute. Uh, and uh, what, what are algebraic devices, uh, algebraic models of computations? Uh, in, informally, we'll soon see a better, a more formal definition. Algebraic algorithms are a algorithm. Let me close the window. So, algebraic algorithms are algorithms that only apply uh, arithmetic, basic arithmetic operations. So they can add, subtract, multiply, and uh, divide. Uh, and we measure the time by roughly the number of operations. This is, of course, uh, in, in the realistic world, it's not uh, uh, the optimal. I mean, it's not very realistic way maybe to, to, to count running time, because we know if we need to add or multiply two very big numbers, it will take some time. It will not take, uh, a, I mean, maybe it's not uh, fair to count it as one step, but it's still a very useful ab abstraction. Uh, and certainly uh, uh, in practice, it's a thing that is very good to measure. Uh, and also of course, lower bounds on the number of operations uh, in particular imply lower bound on, on running time if you only do arithmetic operations. Uh, so let's, let's be a little bit more formal. Uh, here's the most general model of algebraic computation. It's called an algebraic circuit. So algebraic circuit is like a Boolean circuit, except that uh, uh, the operations are uh, arithmetic operations and not Boolean operations. So, and it computes, uh, a, a, well, polynomial or rational functions. Let's, let's focus on polynomials for simplicity. It computes a polynomial in a natural way. So, uh, we have some inputs which are either uh, variables or constants from some field. There's always some, some, you think of it as over some field. And then uh, it computes, the, uh, so this is an addition gate, so it computes x1 plus x2, and this one computes x1 plus x3. And then the multiplication gate multiply whatever is computed here and whatever is computed here, uh, and so on. It's just a, a graphical way to, to represent an algebraic computation. And at the end, you get some polynomial uh, uh, over the field. Uh, let's, let's compare it to the standard model. When you first look at it, you may think, because of I allow these constants from the field, it may look uh, stronger. It can do some things that uh, Turing machines cannot do. For example, I put here one, but I could have put, if we were over the reals or the complex numbers, I could put a square root of two or e or pi or e to the pi, all sort of crazy rational numbers uh, that of course we cannot represent using a finite uh, uh, sequence of bits uh, in decimal or binary expansion. Uh, so it, it has this weird ability to do this thing, to do those, those things, but uh, when you think about it a little bit deeper, it's actually, it's, in many senses, it's weaker than a Turing machine. Uh, one reason is that even though we have these 
this, these um, crazy rational numbers, we can't really access the bits, right? We can't do trivial things like uh, encode all solutions of all instances of SAT using some, some uh, irrational number and then use it as a lookup look table or something like that. We can't access the bits. We can only do arithmetic operations uh, and this really limits uh, whatever we can do with those crazy numbers. Uh, another reason is that this is weaker is that we insist on syntactic computation. What it means is that, let's, let's do it as an example. We, we think about computing polynomials. And for example, over F2, as polynomials, the polynomial X squared is different than the polynomial X. It's not the, the same polynomial, even though it's the same function because zero squared is zero and one squared is one. It's, uh, it's not the same polynomial. And what it means is that if I ask you to, to give a circuit that computes the polynomial X squared, then you cannot give me a circuit that computes the, the uh, polynomial X, which is easier to compute because uh, you just output X, you don't need to multiply. But still, if I, if I ask for S squared, I want to get X squared, not X. That's, uh, that's the, what, what I mean is that uh, we want syntactic computations. Uh, of course, if we think about fields like the complex number, then, then two polynomials uh, agree as a function, if and only if they agree as polynomials. But my point is that even over the complex number, I don't want some other polynomials that agrees on zero one or something like that. I really want uh, the same polynomial that I ask you for. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the model. And as I said, we may, instead of uh, uh, time, when you talk about circuits, it us it's usually uh, also convenient to talk about size, which is, uh, let's just for concreteness, let's say it's the number of edges. And this model, uh, even though uh, it, they're not usually represented like that, all algebraic algorithms that uh, you know and will soon recall, they are in this model. Uh, basically every algorithm that does just two arithmetic operations. Uh, so let, let's give some examples for- uh, Just a question? Yes. This fact that we are insisting on syntactically the right polynomial rather than, you know, semantically modulo, say, you know, the Boolean hypercube or something. Are, are there examples where this is like a key technical concern where you could get the right polynomial semantically, but syntactically it's really hard? Uh, well, I mean, I, I can come up with a maybe artificial example. So here I did over F2, but, you know, over FP, for example, to compute x to the p, you clearly need at least log p gates to, to, to raise it to the power p, but to compute x, you just need one gate. So, it's, so right, so if p is large, you get uh, a, a, an actual separation. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a, a, I can't really think of a better uh, real world example. One reason is that uh, as we soon see, it's also very hard to, turns out to, also be very hard to prove low bounds in this model. So, so yeah. there isn't something that, you know, we can put, we can say it's provably hard in the syntactic model, but very easy in the uh, semantic model. Mm -hmm. I can't think right now. All right, so, so let's see some examples of uh, algorithms in this model. And then we'll also have uh, questions about low bounds in this model. Uh, one example is uh, the DFT, which we mentioned. So we know DFT uh, can be computed in time or in size. Uh, so we usually state it, when you teach it, you usually state it as size, as time, but it's uh, actually a circuit of size O n log n. It's an algebraic circuit. Uh, this is the FFT algorithm. So the trivial thing would have been n squared, but you can actually do it n log n. Uh, there is also an analogous lower bound question, which asks, uh, can you do better? Or, or maybe discrete Fourier transform requires n log n size. This is a, an open problem. Uh, another example is matrix multiplication. So matrix multiplication, we all know, starting from the work on Strass, of Strassen and then many recent improvements, that uh, it can be done in time uh, n to the uh, 2.37 uh, something. Yeah, again, the trivial thing would have been n cubed, but you can actually do much better. Uh, there's a corresponding lower bound question which asks, can you do it in uh, n squared time or close to n squared time? 
Uh, this is a famous open problem. Many people believe that the answer is positive, that you should be able to, well, maybe not n squared, but n to the two plus epsilon or something like that for every epsilon. Uh, but uh, this is an open problem and we don't have a provable, good provable lower bounds for this model. Uh, but all these algorithms chasing uh, decimals further down that we don't even see in this 2.37 expansion, they're all like algebraic Right, right, yeah, I should have stressed that. They are all algebraic circuits. Everything they do is, is uh, in addition and multiplication. Mm, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, as a final example, uh, we all know that the determinant can be computed in polynomial time. Uh, one way to do it is using Gaussian elimination, uh, which is... Uh, Maybe again, you need to think about it for a minute and see it's an guys on elimination is an algebraic circuit. All you do is uh, addition multiplication. You also do division there. Uh, there are uh, algorithms that are better in certain senses. One sense, there are algorithms to do it without division. If you are worried about uh, things like division by zero. Uh, but, uh, and there are also parallel algorithms. So there are many efficient algorithms for, for computing the determinant. Uh, here, the natural analogous lower bound question is, can the permanent, which is very similar to the determinant, can the permanent computed uh, using a polynomial number of arithmetic operations? Uh, we all believe the answer to be negative, but uh, of course we can't prove it. Uh, maybe the, the, the bottom line of this discussion is that uh, we can give many upper bounds, even in this algebraic circuit model, which is somewhat limited, but it's very natural when you consider algebraic problems. We can give clever algorithms. Uh, we are not as good in proving lower bounds. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about algebraic complexity theory. By that, by that I mean, I want to talk about things like uh, complexity classes and reductions. Uh, and to draw analogs to the bull to uh, uh, Boolean complexity theory. So uh, uh, of course, one we all know that one way to uh, state p versus empty problem, uh, sort of in, in disguise, is to say, uh, you know, show me some explicit problems problem that can't be computed in polynomial time. And uh, let's let's we all know what explicit means, but let's. Not worry about it for a second. Things like say, SAT or, or max click or three coloring. Uh, uh, analogous set central goal in algebraic complexity theory is to show that some explicit polynomial can be computed using a polynomial number of operations. Uh, as an example of explicit polynomial, uh, well, all the polynomials we encountered so far as, are, as, are explicit. Uh, some of them have a polynomial size circuit, but uh, so one example to keep in mind for this goal is the permanent, which is, uh, again, I will not define explicit, but the permanent is certainly explicit. Uh, and we want to uh, show that it can be efficiently computed. Uh, in, algebra, in uh, standard complexity theory, we of course know that these problems I picked are not uh, random. <laughs> they have an important property that they are NP complete. Or again, one informal way to state it is that all explicit problems, really all NP problems, are just uh, SAT in disguise. You can uh, do some polynomial time computation and convert them to an instance of SAT. Uh, in algebraic complexity, we have an analogous theorem that is called valiant theorem, that was proved by valiant. And it says that all explicit polynomials are really just permanent you can find a reduction. I didn't define yet what is a reduction. We'll soon do it. But from any explicit polynomials, uh, whatever you, you okay, you, I mean, uh, you need to, to give a definition. I don't want to define really explicit polynomials, but uh, basically any polynomial you can imagine is probably explicit. So all explicit polynomials are just permanent and in addition, there is this curious feature that all efficiently computable polynomials are really just determinant, determinant in disguise. So uh, if you ever wondered, uh, I wondered, uh, when you're an undergrad, you kept seeing the determinant comes up in every class. And at some point, 
uh, you start asking yourself what's going on. Uh, well, one way to explain it, maybe valiance way to explain it is to say that the determinant is the universal polynomial. Anything you can compute, uh, you might as well compute it as a determinant. That's, uh, that's quite a, a surprising thing. Uh, in complexity theoretic language, we would say that determinant is complete for a class which I will call algebraic P and permanent is complete for a class that I will call algebraic NP. Uh, again, in this audience, you may have seen that uh, sometimes these classes are called VP and VNP where V stands for valiant. So uh, again, complete, I need to say with respect to which reductions. So uh, it's not super important for this talk, but since we came all the way here, let's, uh, we might as well see it. Uh, reductions in algebraic complexity are just linear functions. So uh, yeah, maybe I should have said this whole question of algebraic P versus NP, which we said uh, is uh, uh, the algebraic analog of P versus NP. This whole question is whether you can efficiently reduce the permanent to the determinant. And reduce here means linear functions. So this question is really, what is the minimal integer M such that you can find a linear map L from n by n matrices to m by m matrices. So it takes x to L of x, such that the n by n permanent of x, think of x as here as a symbolic matrix of variables. So x in the ij cell is a variable xij. So the n by n permanent polynomial of x should equal the m by m determinant polynomial of L of x. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice exercise, an easy exercise to, to do it for two by two, uh, from, for n equals two, uh, then you can take m equals two. Already for n equals three, it's get, it gets kind of uh, annoying if you try it. Uh, and again, it's not even clear a priori that this thing is finite. It's not one of these questions when there's an obvious uh, finite upper bound, but nevertheless, Valiant proved that it's finite, that M, you can take M to be at most exponential in N. This is not the hard part of, of Valiant's theorem. The uh, more interesting part is that M is polynomial in N if and only if algebraic P equals algebraic NP. Uh, so it's, it's uh, on one hand, you have this, computation and complexity uh, statement. Does algebraic P equal algebraic NP? On the other end of this equivalence, you have this uh, very easy to state and uh, very natural mathematical question. Uh, what's the minimal M such that you can, you can find a linear function that takes the permanent to the determinant, right? This is something that you can ask uh, your mathematician friend without giving any, any background. Uh, and it does give some, some hope that maybe these things uh, are also uh, easier to solve because well, people have been studying mathematics for hundreds of years. Uh, yeah, is there question, a question again. Yeah, so at this point in algebraic complexity talks, uh, like usually we don't get to see the definitions of VP and VNP, right? I mean, if the speaker says something, ah, oh, think about permanent, think about determinant. So I'm just curious, like, because when it comes to P and NP, like Cook's theorem, once you get the general idea, right? Okay, we have this Turing machine tableau and write down the CNF formula encoding this, it's more like then it's annoying, but it's, it's something that's not hard, right? It's sort of, once you get the idea, it's sort of clear. So I guess, I don't know if it's possible to ask this, but like valence, like how hard is it? How hard is it, would it be? Like how much time would you have to spend if you were actually, you know, tell us the details and do the reductions? Is it like super deep or is it just more annoying or somewhere uh, in between? Okay, so there, there are, uh, uh, that's a good question. So there are two completeness results here. One is the determinant for the determinant, the other is for permanent. For the determinant, it's quite easy. If, uh, if I had, uh, you know, a, 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 Ten, I mean, uh, well, in the second part, I, I can actually show it, but maybe there are better things to show, but it will not take more than 15 minutes for the determinant. Uh, for the permanent, it's uh, more complicated, but I would maybe I would classify it in the annoying pile of the things that uh, there are details to take care of. Uh, I think I saw Amir Yudayev in, in the audience. He has a YouTube video where he explains it. 
and it takes like it's like two videos of I think two hours each or something like that. But I mean, it really goes over all the details. But uh, uh, yeah, it takes some time. Uh, it takes some time. There are uh, uh, all sorts of gadgets that you need to construct, uh, which is uh, why yeah you don't uh, usually do it. I guess. One way to define VNP, once you know that permanent is great, one way to define VNP is just everything that is by the complete problem, right? Everything which reduces to the permanent. This is not very convincing that this is a natural class to consider, but this is a, 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 a succinct definition. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe one last thing I will say, a good way to think about VNP is that uh, is as, uh, it's not the, uh, it's not, uh, and if and only if, it's not a characterization, but if a polynomial has the property that given a monomial, I give you a, a, the input as a monomial and you can compute in polynomial time the coefficient. If it has this property, then it's in VNP. And I think probably most polynomials, unless we, you know, we try to come up with a counter example, with a counter example, most polynomials that uh, we think of has this property that Again, you can decide, given a monomial, the, the, the coefficient. All right, so, so yes, this is what uh, I, I, I want to uh, conclude this discussion with, that the determinant versus permanent is P versus NP for, for uh, the algebraic computation. Uh, we also know that in some senses, it must be solved before P versus NP. Uh, because you can sort of prove, okay, here will be informal, but it's better to be informal and, and explain the essence than to go over all the details. In some sense, if algebraic P equals algebraic NP, then P equals NP. But we all believe, of course, that there are, uh, P does not equal NP and algebraic P uh, does not equal algebraic NP. So in terms of separations, the uh, uh, algebraic separation is implied by the Boolean separation, separation so uh, we might as well start uh, with the algebraic uh, separation. But of course, uh, we don't know uh, how to prove it. Uh, and uh, okay, just for this specific problem, uh, uh, you know, we want to prove M is, uh, is um, exponential in N or at least super polynomial. Uh, we can pro prove there's something which is a little, bit, a little bit bigger than the number of variables by, by some constant, which is bigger than one, uh, which is related to what I'm going to talk about today, but I will not show specifically this result. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, this is uh, some, uh, uh, something that I will quickly go over. As I said, we expect it to be easier and, uh, and uh, you know, people have suggested some, some approaches based on, on um, a, 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 some areas in mathematics. One thing you may have heard about is geometric complexity theory. I will not go into it. Uh, I will just, again, briefly state that there are also some, some uh, barrier results. So you probably know the barrier results for Boolean computation. There are also some analogous barrier results for a, a quote unquote natural proofs for algebraic circuit. But uh, all right, let's, let's not talk about this. Maybe what, what I prefer to talk about is that, so we want to prove, uh, you know, our goal somehow uh, later in the future is to prove super polynomial lower bounds for, for circuits, uh, either Boolean or, or uh, algebraic. We can be less ambitious and we can say, well, let's, let's start by proving that some problem, some explicit problem requires super linear time, right? More time than the time you need to uh, read the input. This is a, a, a natural thing to ask first. Uh, we don't know it in Boolean computation, right? We don't have a super linear uh, a circuit lower bound for any function uh, even in NP. Uh, and uh, this is okay. Here, here's some good news that this is known for algebraic circuits. So uh, there is a theorem of Bauer and Strassen that they give a circuit lower bound of n log n for for uh, well, it works for uh, many polynomials. But let's give two specific examples. One is uh, the power symmetric polynomial, so sum x i to the n, and the other is the elementary symmetric polynomial. 
uh, where you take the degree to be uh, something around n over two. It doesn't have to be exactly n over two. It can be uh, n, n, n constant times n. Uh, well, not n itself, uh, like, uh, like let's say n over three, uh, two n over three, etc. Uh, so uh, this is a super linear circuit law bounds n times log n, uh, which is uh, or, well, of course, it's not super polynomial, but it's uh, great. It's also tight. They are also tight lower bound. This is very easy to see for the power symmetric polynomials to compute the x1 to the n. You just raise it to, um, you just do repeated squaring log n times, and then you do it for each of the variables. It's less trivial to see for the elementary symmetric polynomial, but it's also true. Uh, and uh, okay, this is, this is a super linear lower bound. Uh, in this talk, in in uh, in well, the time I have left for this hour, and then in the second hour, what we'll see are better lower bounds for weaker models. I mean, but they are slightly weaker models. They are not uh, uh, ridiculously weak models. Uh, so I need to explain what are the models, and then uh, I will present the lower bounds. Let me make a small aside, which is uh, like, yeah, it's a, it's a story for another day. It's a whole different uh, talk. There's an important of an open problem here. The polynomials for which we prove the lower bounds has degree, which is something like n, the number of variables. It's very interesting to prove lower bounds for low degree polynomials, things like linear functions or, or, or um, uh, like DFT or, uh, or bilinear or quadratic like matrix multiplication. Uh, this is uh, okay. This is a very interesting open problem, but not something uh, I will mention. So let's let's say why are what are the weaker models? The first model is easy to define. There there are uh, algebraic formulas. Uh, so formula is exactly like a circuit, except it's a tree. Uh, so here's an example. The circuit is a tree. Uh, other ways to say it is that the fan out the out degree of every node is one. So you cannot reuse computation, right? If, if I had a circuit, here I compute x1 plus x2. If I had a circuit, I could just, I wouldn't need to do it again here in this node. I could just take an edge from, from this node and, and connect it here. But this is a formula. So whenever I need something I already computed, I have to recompute it. Formulas are, are less natural from a, like a programming point of view, but, uh, but when you write math, you are write formulas, right? You usually don't write circuits. Uh, so this is the model of formulas. And then to present the second model, uh, okay, let, let's motivate it like that. So there are formulas on, like, on the weaker end of the spectrum, there's formulas. And on the stronger end, there's the circuits. Uh, and the formulas, again, I will, I will draw analogs to Boolean computation. Formulas correspond to a class which we call NC1 and circuits correspond to a class we call P or P slash poly, right? We will not go discuss uniformity issues at all. Uh, and in the middle, we have a model which we call algebraic branching programs. Uh, and you can think of them as branching programs in Boolean computation, usually model bounded space computation. So you can think of algebraic branching programs, which I will, I will soon define more clearly, but just to get an intuition, this is something like uh, the class NL or maybe parity L uh, uh, this is something that between NC1 and P. And we know that uh, polynomial formulas can be polynomially simulated by algebraic branching programs or ABPs. And ABPs can be polynomially simulated by circuits. Now this poly here is, I mean, uh, always when you worry about polynomial factors, it becomes somewhat sensitive to the way you define this model. So for certain definitions, it's, there's no, there isn't even a polynomial loss. It's just a, 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 a special case. But uh, for other definitions, you get a polynomial loss. So when you talk about lower bounds, you cannot always deduce, a, I mean, super polynomial lower bounds are, are a different thing, but polynomial lower bounds uh, are, are, do not always translate from one model to another and you need to be a little bit careful about defining the model. So this is the, like, the algebraic uh, point of view, uh, the algebraic, uh, yeah, yeah. but uh, something uh, also interesting happens in the algebraic world that this class P 
algebraic P also equals the class algebraic NC2. Uh, this is not something we know in the Boolean world, nor do we believe it. We believe that, uh, uh, we don't believe that for Boolean circuits, every polynomial size circuit can be uh, simulated by a circuit of depth log squared and poly polynomial size. Uh, but in algebraic circuits, it turns out to be true. In particular, if I were to draw an arrow from circuits back to formulas, this means that I can, I can write on this arrow quasi-poly. So up to quasi-polynomial uh, things, uh, circuits can be simulated by formulas. This is a result of uh, Valiant, Skium, Berkovich, and Rakoff. And again, this is quite unique to the algebraic world. This is not something we expect in the Boolean world. Uh, in particular, exponential lower bounds for formulas will imply super polynomial lower bounds for circuits, which uh, uh, again, it's quite encouraging uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you want to pull lower bounds, right? Because formulas are maybe simpler to uh, analyze than circuits. Or, or maybe the pessimist way to view it is that formulas are quite powerful. Uh, so so uh, again, this is the, the algebraic landscape is, is uh, different here than the Boolean landscape. So let's define what are algebraic branching programs. Uh, it will be a definition by a picture. So a branching program, is, it's a directed graph. It goes from left to right. And there is a source vertex and a sink vertex, S and T. And then there are layers. And each edge is labeled by a linear function in the variables. So uh, I just wrote examples, right? This edge is labeled by this linear function and, and so on. And the way it computes a thing is that every path from S and T multiplies the labels on the edges. And what the ABP computes is the sum over all the paths of those uh, multiplication of edge labels over the path. Uh, so uh, this, if you have seen Boolean branching programs, this is uh, uh, somewhat similar, at least for the parity, uh, for the parity branching program model where, where uh, you do the exact same thing uh, over uh, F2. But again, Boolean models is concerned with semantically computing a function. And here we are concerned with syntactically computing a function. Uh, and again, we measure the size by the number of vertices. There's also a parameter which I will refer to later, so we might as well define it, which is called the width, which is the width of a layer is the number of vertices in that layer, and the width of the program is the maximum uh, over the layers of the width of a layer. Uh, oh, I have a sketch. All right, so this is the uh, ABPs, like we said, uh, these are stronger than formulas. It's uh, again, it's a cute exercise to, to figure out how to simulate programs with uh, branching programs. And uh, it's uh, weaker than circuit because it's, uh, also, it's again an easy exercise to see how to simulate this thing with a circuit. Uh, and the, the theorem that uh, again, in this hour, we only have time to present but next hour we will uh, we'll see most of the proof, is that every uh, ABP or formula that computes uh, the same polynomials, or uh, okay, maybe for technical reason I put here N over four, it will be simpler. Uh, so again, the power sum or elementary symmetric polynomial has size N squared. Uh, so this is better than N log N, but uh, okay, the model is weaker. It's an ABP or a formula. Uh, these are tight. Uh, this is again easy to see for some xi to the n. Uh, it's a nice thing to see for elementary symmetric polynomials. If uh, I have a, if I have ten minutes in the second hour, I think I will show it just because it's a, a nice thing that shows the. Uh, it's a good way to see the power of the algebraic computation. But what non-trivial things it can do. So uh, these lower bounds are tight. Uh, some, some previous results that were known. So for formulas, actually our uh, um, improvement is not dramatic in a quantitative way. There were n squared over log n lower bounds for formulas, 
Uh, what does make it slightly interesting is that uh, uh, the fact that I wrote here 66, I mean, this thing, uh, it was proven by Calocotti, but it's really an adaptation of uh, uh, the well-known uh, work of Nechipok. And this is the best lower bound also for Boolean formulas. It's some method that Nechipok came up with, um, you know, more than 50 years ago. And the interesting part is that uh, we know that this method cannot prove anything better than n squared over log n. This is, this is where it gets, probably gets stuck. So it's, again, it's not a dramatic improvement, but it's still somewhat interesting that we are able to go beyond uh, this n squared over log n. Again, only very slightly, but uh, it's the first time that, that, you know, something we, we can do something for formulas that is better than the Chipotle's method. Uh, and, uh, oh, I, I even wrote it here. It's a very interesting open problem, by the way, to, to extend this result to Boolean formulas, to, to improve the uh, Nechipur global ones for Boolean formulas. I don't know how to do it, but it's an interesting thing. Uh, for branching programs, there was a previous lower bound by um, Rinal, one of my co-authors in this work, for homogeneous branching programs. Uh, uh, I will explain what it means in a second, where we'll see, uh, well, we'll talk about the sketch of the proof, and we'll start with the homogeneous case. Um, uh, oh, okay, so this is, yeah, okay, maybe I will find homogeneous branching programs are branching program where every node computes a homogeneous polynomials and we will soon see why it's a, why it's a simpler case. Can uh, I ask you like a high level naive question about the algebraic branching programs? Yes. So it seems to me that if you come, if, if I look at algebraic circuits and Boolean circuits, then I can sort of see that they're in some sense the same, right? I mean, but one is operating with just Boolean values and Boolean gates and the other one with polynomials, but they seem to me fairly similar. But when I think of a Boolean branching program, I like, you know, I think of a somehow taking it, 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 it the, you know, an input somehow defines a path that leads me to a value. Whereas algebraic branching programs on the face of it seems like to be a completely different animal where I like explore everything in parallel and multiply on edges. And like, is there some way of seeing like, why is, why is this what an algebraic branching program should be? I mean, does the question uh, make yeah. sense? So, so yeah, I, so I think, I mean, you, what you define is a deterministic branching program, but I think if you are, if you are familiar with the model of parity branching program, so parity mm -hmm. branching programs are, are a non-deterministic branching program. And what it means is that uh, you can have multiple edges labeled by a literal that are going out of every, of every vertex. Uh -huh. And the acceptance criterion is whether the number of paths of accepting paths is uh, uh, odd or even. Uh -huh. so, so it's a very similar model, but uh, over F2. Okay. So uh, I was missing them. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So it's, so yeah. So uh, this is why I, I prefer to think of it as a bike analog of something like NL or or or, or parity L. Uh, yes, because in the deterministic setting, uh, uh, you are right. They are, I mean, the the Boolean model is is um, more limited. Okay. Thanks. So so let's say. Uh, uh, I guess maybe we should take a break in about five to 10 minutes, but let me explain what goes on in the proof. And then in the next hour, we can uh, actually show it. So let's say we have a degree n polynomial just so we don't have to, to keep the, the degree parameter going on. If you have a, a width w a b p, then this gives a way to decompose f as a sum of w things where each thing is a product of polynomials of degree roughly n over two, right? Just, just pick the, the middle layer here. And each of these nodes define the path, uh, poly, uh, this, such, such a product where a GI will be everything that goes from S to here, and HI will be everything that goes from here to T. And you can do a counting argument, just count the number of parameters and see that a random polynomial F, whatever that means, requires w to be exponential in n when you uh, just just count how many parameters you have uh, on the left hand side and on the right hand side like how many coefficients can you pick it's not really a counting argument over over infinite field but but you can do a counting you just have to, to count a different thing you can do a counting argument and 
basically the bottom line of this argument is that your intuition would work. I mean, the number of parameter thing is a good way to measure. So a random F will require exponentially many summons, but we cannot prove exponential lower bound. The best lower bound we can prove for such representation are linear. This is not a trivial thing, even linear, I will, I will, but I will prove it in the, in the second uh, half of the talk. Uh, but the hope with this linear thing is that you can sort of uh, do it for uh, enough layers. So you don't have to pick the exact middle layer. You can pick all layers in uh, between n over three to two n over three or something like that. And if you can show that each layer has n vertices, then you get yourself a, uh, uh, an n squared lower bound. Uh, this thing works very well in the homogeneous case because there, uh, 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 all right, we, we will see it in the second half. I don't think I will have time maybe here uh, now, but so here's the lemma that we can prove. It's not even a, a, the, a, a very general case, but it's sufficient for the homogeneous case that let's focus on the power symmetric polynomial for now. Suppose you can write it as this sum GH, GJ times HJ, where J goes from one to K. And further suppose that these, gj and aj are homogeneous of degree at least one there's no upper bound in the degree but there is uh, a lower bound in the degree then k has to be at least n over two this is a linear lower bound uh, and again this, for this thing it is also tight unfortunately uh, yeah this is some what i will prove in the second half of the talk but and this gives you the lower bound for the homogeneous case because in I will quickly in the homogeneous case everything all the linear functions are, are really linear and not affine there are no constants because everything computes a linear function so you can really control the degrees here in the first layer everything will be of degree one here everything will be of degree two and then you reach degree n minus one and then you reach degree n it is uh, very limited because of the homogeneity condition so in particular, you can do it for this layer and you get that the polynomial you're trying to compute is sum of, if you have W vertices here, or, or K I call it, you can write it as sum of HJ times GJ for this first layer. And you get that the first layer has at least N over two and the second layer has at least N over two vertices and so on. This is the lower bound. If you believe the lemma, this is the entire lower bound for the homogeneous case. It, for the non-homogeneous case, things are, are, are more uh, complicated than, because we, we don't have this nice structure anymore and there can be cancellation and you can suddenly have many layers and things in the, uh, things, let's say we, we look at layer N minus one, you can have things of very low degree suddenly because there were cancellations. So uh, maybe because, I, maybe, yeah. So what we need to prove is to, somehow extend this lower bound, but I think it would be better to, to do this in the second now that, I mean, I have some slides, but maybe it would be better to take a small break. And then we have some a, a extended a lower bound of this width, which is a, parts of it are very easy to generalize and parts of it are a bit harder. And then we also do need to do something on the ABP to use this. So maybe now would be, I mean, I think we are at about the 15 minute mark. So now we'll be, uh, maybe a good time to take a break and relax. And in the second half, uh, my plan is to first prove this lemma. Uh, where is this lemma? This lemma. And then uh, to show you how do we handle general AVPs and how we extend this lemma. Sounds great. So before we take a 10 minute break, is there any question comment anything that we should discuss or should we just we can also take a break and just leave the chat open or i think okay. most of us will probably stick around and then we'll uh, or if you feel like typing something into the chat that's fine but for now i think we're taking a, a 10 minute break then reconvening at uh, six minutes past. 
So we are back after the break and looking forward to some details on the board, as it seems. Right. Yes. So this is the lemma we uh, promised, uh, I promised that we will prove. If, uh, let's call this polynomial f some xi to the n, if you can write it as some uh, pj times qj, uh, and they are homogeneous, so they get at least one, then k is at least n over two. Uh, it's also true, as I said, for a, a elementary symmetric polynomial, the proof is much simpler for this polynomial though, so we will do it for that and then uh, we'll say some things like that. Uh, all right, so uh, it requires some uh, preparation, this lemma. Uh, so let's start with a definition. Uh, I don't remember it, sorry, I don't remember if you said so, but is this tight? Uh, yes, it's tight. I mean, it's, N is very easy to see, right? Because uh, you can write like X oh, I yes. over two times. And I think you can even shave off this two factor using uh, right X squared plus Y squared, the factor right is over C. Yeah, yeah, we are over C for this whole discussion. Uh, we can do it over other fields as well, but, uh, but then some annoying things happen. So let's assume we are over the complex numbers. Uh, Yes, all right. So, so let's start with maybe the definition. Yes, we are over C because C uh, is an algebraically closed field and we will do some uh, algebraic geometry. So it's much more convenient. Uh, we're very basic, don't, don't be afraid. Uh, so uh, we say a set V in C to the N is uh, a variety. This is again, something you might know if uh, uh, basically, if V is a zero set of polynomials, what, what it means is that there are F1 through FT, there are N variate polynomials, X1 to Xn, such that V is all the Xs in C to Tn, so that's such, such that f1 of x equals f2 of x equals ft of x equals zero. Uh, so a few comments about this definition. Uh, if you are uh, maybe no more than me about algebraic geometry, you might, I mean, this is actually, uh, this is something which to be completely precise, I need to call an affine variety, uh, but I will not uh, talk about the other kinds of varieties. So I will just say varieties. Uh, another thing you might be concerned about is that uh, sometimes this is called an algebraic set and then a variety is a special type of this thing, which is irreducible in some sense. I will again, not make this distinction. For us, this will be a variety. And a final thing is that I sort of implicitly assumed here that the number of polynomials defining the variety is finite. And this turned out to be true without loss of generality. If you, uh, if you pick an infinite set, uh, then there's always a finite set which defines the same variety. Uh, maybe uh, we should also introduce the notation that we are going to use. In that case, we'll write uh, this uh, V of F1 to Ft. So for any set of polynomial, V of uh, the set of polynomial is the variety that they define. Uh, and the only thing we will need about varieties is this fact that I will even not prove that, uh, oh, maybe for the fact, let's, let, I mean, as examples, example, you can always think about uh, linear subspaces or affine subspaces of C to the N, in those cases, those FIs are just linear functions or affine functions, right? Polynomials of degree one. So if there are polynomials of degree one, you get a linear subspace or an affine subspace, but uh, in general, you can uh, um, talk about higher degree polynomials, right? So, but affine subspaces are a very good example to keep in mind, especially uh, because of this next, fact that I will state, uh, okay, I will state it in a slightly funny way that varieties have dimension. Uh, 
which I will denote by dim of b. Uh, what do I mean by that? <laughs> I mean that it's possible to uh, associate with each variety a certain number, which is called the dimension. So uh, dim v is an integer between zero to n. N is the, there's always some ambient uh, C to the N uh, subspace. So dim V is an integer between uh, zero to N and it behaves in many senses as you would accept for dimensions. So it's not a, a trivial even how to define dimension. It's uh, if you take an algebraic geometry class, it's like a thing that, well, depending on what you do, you, know, you usually don't do in the first lecture. Uh, there are several equivalent definitions and uh, it's like a whole story, but we will only need very basic properties, which are the following. Uh, so maybe let's do properties of dimension. So the maybe let's start with the zeroth property, which we will not strictly need, but it's good to have in mind that if V is a linear subspace, then its dimension, uh, its dimension as a variety is its dimension as linear subspace. It, it generalizes uh, the usual notion that we know of dimension for subspaces. Uh, so again, this is why I said that uh, uh, linear subspaces are good to keep in mind. The next properties we will see will also be, uh, it will be very easy to check that they hold for, for linear dimension. So this is why they are natural. So this is property zero. Property one says that if V is a subset of W, then the dimension of V is at most the dimension of W. Uh, again, trivially true for linear dimension. Maybe I should also point out a difference that in linear dimension, if V is a subspace of W and they have the same dimension, then V equals W. This is not true for varieties in general. Okay, this is property one. Property two says that if V is a finite set, then the dimension of V equals zero. Again, true for a, a subspaces, if you remember that we are over C and not over finite fields. So uh, easy to check. Uh, the third property says that if, this will be the last property that we need, if V, is a variety which is defined by T polynomials. So let's think what it means in the linear uh, uh, case. If a subspace is defined by T linear functions, so I mean, it's, uh, we always, it's basically the functions that define it are the dual. So uh, the subspace is a solutions to a set of T linear equations. So, if there are affine equations, which is the modern case, there can be two things. Either, either there's no solution, in which case V is empty, but if V is non-empty, if there is a solution, then, then the, the dimension of the space of solution has, is at least N minus T. And this is also true in this case. Of course, this is meaningful only when T is, uh, uh, is uh, less than N, which is not without loss of generality the case for varieties, but it is still something that is true. So in terms of uh, how much different polynomials constrain the dimension, linear polynomials are like the worst in some sense. I mean, if, 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 I, if I want to have T polynomials and bring the dimension down as much as I can, then I might as well pick them to be affine or linear functions. Right, and independent. And independent, yeah. 
Yes. But somehow it's not like a, a quadratic or cubic uh, polynomial could somehow miraculously, you know, bring down the dimension by an additive three or something. That's not the right. way. Right, right, right. Uh, all right. This is everything we need for the from the dimension, and and uh, let's let's go back to the lemma for a second. We have this thing of f equals uh, pi times qi. So the plan is to define, given a polynomial, to define some variety, and then to compute the dimension of the of the left hand side and of the right hand side and uh, and to get some lower bound on k this is the plan so in order to define the variety we need one last definition uh, which is uh, it has a scary name but it's just it will be the last definition so uh, here the definition which is they call it uh, the singular locus of a polynomial G, which is usually denoted seeing of G, uh, is uh, the variety defined by the partial derivative of G. So for each variable xi through xn, I can look at the polynomial uh, delta g over, I don't really know how to pronounce this character, but the partial derivative of, the derivative of g with respect to xi. Uh, and there are n such polynomials and the variety of those polynomials uh, is called uh, the singular locus of g. So the plan, now we can, say completely the plan. The plan is to compute, compute the singular locus of this polynomial, some set at the end, the singular locus of such expressions and, uh, and the dimension, and, uh, and then to get the lower bound of n. So let's do it. It's not uh, complicated at all. Let's start with, uh, let's compute the singular locus of some xi to the n. Uh, well, what is the partial derivative of this polynomial with respect to uh, xi? It's just, uh, well, by linearity, everything which is xj to the n is zero. And then you have n times xi to the n minus one. Uh, and then I guess we needed, somehow, somewhere we needed to state that n is at least uh, two. Or oh, otherwise, this doesn't work. Uh, so, so the singular locus means that all of these polynomials, i goes from one to n. All of these polynomials. When, when, when is this is zero? And recall that n is larger than two. This is zero only if x i equals zero, and this is true for every i. So, uh, so the simple corollary is that seeing some xi to the n is only the zero point. And in particular, uh, the dimension of this variety is zero because of the property that uh, finite sets have dimension zero. All right, that was a uh, not complicated, I hope, but now let's take the derivative uh, of this expression. And uh, so the derivative of f with respect to, oh, I got too many indices. I guess let's do it xj because here the index was i, was, so uh, derivative is linear. So we start by taking i from k. And now we need to use the product rule to uh, take the derivative of pi times qi. So this is pi times the derivative of qi with respect to xj plus uh, the derivative of pi with respect to xj times qi. I hope that I didn't uh, uh, mix up the indices. Uh, anyway, in particular, uh, 
the singular locus of, uh, or maybe you should say, uh, notice that whenever pi and qi are zero, then this whole sum is zero. I mean, I, if pi for every i is zero and qi for every i is zero, then this whole sum is zero because every uh, summand is zero. So in particular, the, the singular locus of f uh, contains the variety defined by p1 to pk and q1 to qk. And, and now we take a, a dimension for both sides and dimension a, a, a respect inclusion in the sense that left, I mean, if this contains this, then the dimension of this is at least the dimension of this. And the dimension of this, we said it's zero. So zero is at least the dimension of this. And here we use the third property that we have a variety defined by 2K polynomial. And we want to say that this dimension is at least N minus 2K, but we just need one more argument that recall property three said that they can be this annoying case where V is a, a, the empty set. But fortunately this is true because we assumed that PI and QI are homogeneous of degree at least one. In particular, zero, the old zero point is in this variety. So we know they have one common zero, which is the old zero point, which means that the, the, the variety they define is not empty. And if it's not empty, it has dimension at least n minus k, so k is at least n over two. And you know, this looks like, like a lot of hair splitting, this thing of uh, having a common point, but it's easy to see, I mean, if I didn't require uh, anything about PI and QI, because I didn't put an upper bound on the degree, then clearly you can just take P1 equals F and Q1 equals one, right? And have, and have K equals one. So obviously I need to require something uh, if I, if I uh, don't put an upper bound on the degree. And uh, this is uh, one thing you can require. Really all we needed is that uh, they have a common zero. So homogeneity is only used for that. Right, so we can replace and we will soon replace homogeneity by a, a just having a common zero. In, in practice, it's, it's, the easiest thing is to require that they have no constant, that the constant term is zero and then the all zero point is a, is a common zero. So, so this is a dilemma that we wanted to prove and this works for homogeneous ABPs. Now I want to talk about general ABPs and uh, I planned it in a different way, but now I think it's more natural if I first start by analyzing general ABPs, explain what we are doing, and then we'll sort of uh, arrive at the right generalization of this lemma that we need. So let's, let's assume, let's go back to ABPs and assume we have this ABP that computes uh, some XI to the end. So, uh, so I draw it in sort of a sketchy way where this is S and this is T and, uh, and these are the layers in the middle. And this is supposed to be like three, three dots. So, uh, and here is the idea. As we say, we can't a priori bound, we want to pull a lower bound of N squared and we can't a priori bound the depth, but it's certainly let's call the depth D. It's certainly at most N squared, otherwise there's nothing to prove. Right, if there are more than N squared variables, if, if there are most than N squared the layers, there are more than N squared vertices. And so we can assume the depth is at, at most N squared. And uh, the idea is to try to do the same thing of decomposing it according to some middle layer. And then we get uh, stuck somehow, but then we find out how to fix it. 
So let's le let's look at the uh, uh, for example all layers in the range d over three to two d over three. That, those layers in the middle. Uh, and the point here that unless the IBP is very big, and then there's nothing to prove. I mean, bigger than, uh, I don't know, epsilon and squared. So unless it's very big and then we are done, there has to be one layer here in the middle, which is uh, somewhat small. So the layer has less than something like n squared over d, and maybe let's even put here a small constant, like one over 100, n squared over d vertices. Uh, just, but just by averaging, right? If there, are, if there are more than d over three layers with more than n squared over t vertices, then, then the, the AP is big and we are done. So we will pick that layer And uh, right, let's let's do this uh, zoom in thing. This is the layer, and it has k vertices, and k is not uh, huge. That's the point. And we can again do this decomposition, where this would be p one, and this would be q one, and now we have p two, and q two, and so on up to p k q k. So you can write f as a sum of pi times qi, i goes from one to k. This is as before, the problem is that, uh, I mean, the entire problem is here is that the fact that we cannot give a lower bound on k. And the reason that it doesn't work is because we can't guarantee that this common zero property, we can't guarantee the fact that the uh, singular locus of, of this polynomial will, uh, of the right hand side, will be, uh, uh, I mean, it's not the right hand side of P, P1 to PK and Q1 to, to QK. We can't guarantee that this variety has, is non empty. So, the pro, uh, you know, if we knew, I mean, can't guarantee. common zero of P1, PK, Q1, QK. And, uh, and the idea to solve it is again, if we knew, uh, if we knew they are constant free, the constant free means that the constant term is zero. If we knew the constant term is always zero, then uh, it's fine by the same proof because we only use homogeneity to, to claim that the all zero point is a common zero. So, uh, so let's just try to <laughs> force it in some sense. So we write uh, pi as pi prime plus alpha i and qi as qi prime plus beta i. Uh, here I, I just take alpha i to be the, the constant term of and beta of alpha i and beta i to be the constant term of q i so that p prime i q prime i are now constant free. Uh, so f maybe we should write it f was some i some p i q i it's now some p i prime plus alpha i times QI prime plus beta i. And the idea is to now, we will make this transformation on the ABP to a different ABP, which will not compute F any longer. It will compute F plus some error polynomial, but we will be able to analyze how this thing affects the ABP and how the error, error in quotes, how it behaves. So let's see how, how we do it. 
So remember that we had, uh, I will just show a sketch of it. We had P1 times Q1, let's just do it for one. It will explain the difference. And I want to uh, transform it. This is T. I want to transform it in the following way. So instead of this P1 times Q1, here I will write uh, alpha one and here I will write Q1, and I will do it for all K. I just replace P1 by its constant term. Plus, I will add a new AVP, and adding two AVPs is, uh, is quite easy. You just uh, connect them in parallel, where I do uh, the analogous thing with P1. Here I, here I replace, so we took an AVP and we made it to a slightly larger ABP, but, the, but this will still be beneficial. But this ABP now computes a different polynomial. So we replaced every, every, this path P1 times Q1, we replaced this entire path by a single edge that computes alpha one. And we, we, here in this part, and in this part, we replace this entire path by a single edge computing B1. And we do it for all K things in parallel. So, uh, maybe first, let's see what does this new thing computes? And then we'll analyze how this affects the IBPs. Well, this computes, maybe, I mean, maybe it's, it will be easier if, if to see if I do it for, uh, for two things. So my, the point is that this entire part of the IBP is now gone here. And this entire part is now gone here. They are just constant. So, this thing computes some uh, yes, some alpha i times q i plus some p i times beta i. Now, what is this thing? I claim this is nothing but the original F. Here, here we have F, right? So let's expand this. So when we expand F, we get a bunch of things which are PI prime times QI prime, which uh, we don't get here. So it's F, oops, I'm sorry, minus sum of PI prime times QI prime, but this, sum starts to look good, right? Because this is a sum of K products and these are constant free, constant free polynomials. So it starts to look like something that we can analyze. So it's not really F, it's F minus this. Uh, and then there's another thing that uh, maybe it's hard to see. So QI is really QI prime plus BI and plus beta I and PI is PI prime plus alpha I. So this sum of alpha i, beta i, here I get it twice from here and from here. And here I only get this once. So, uh, so this is a plus sum alpha i, beta i, which is a constant. So I, I won't care about it, right? The point in all of this discussion was that this is some this is, I'm sorry, this is a product of constant free. And this is constant. So we did something and we are going to do it, you know, when, in, when something well, seems to work well, you do it again. <laughs> uh, but let's analyze what happens here. This was one step. Well, no, maybe this doesn't matter, but why don't you get the minus for both corrections? Uh, like maybe alpha I'm, i, beta i, they're all, you're also... S I mean, in, in this side, I have two, I, two times alpha i, beta i, but f only give me once. So I think I need to add one more. Where are... Uh, 
ah wait ah okay because you're going back to the sorry um there are no primes I mean, it's not the... important even if it were minus it wouldn't be important but, uh... yeah, yeah no but i was i i guess i got i lost the primes okay good yes, yes. it's very confusing i also uh, keep uh, missing the signs but the good news is that it's not important mm -hmm. uh, so Let's let, let's see uh, how this affects the ABP. Here is a good thing: is that the new depth is two thirds of the old depth. Because right here we had the originally we had depth D, but now this was some layer in the middle, and we replaced here we replace all of this part by a constant, so the entire path is now this plus one edge. And we did the same thing here. So this the whole part is gone. It's just one edge. So the longest part is here plus one edge. So the new depth is at most two thirds times the old depth. This is good. Uh, new size, it, it, it's a little bit bigger than the old size, but it's not bigger by a lot. And actually you can do it without making the size bigger at all. So I will not do it because it's, uh, I mean, you, you could just absorb this constant into, into uh, Q1, it's, it's confusing. But uh, the point is that uh, even if we don't, and I mean, even if you say that the size increase, it does, didn't increase by a lot because here we get rid of all of this part and just add a few edges. And here we got rid of that part and just added a few edges. So new size is uh, not much larger than original size. And as I said, you can actually do it without increasing the size at all. This is again good because in the end, we, we get a lower bound on the final ABP. So we don't want the size to be much larger. Uh, so what, what's the bad thing? The bad thing is that we accrue some error terms. What I mean by that is that now we no longer compute F. But we compute F plus sum of PI prime times QI prime, where here we have K thing. Well, what was K? K was, if you remember, it was something like N squared over D. It's not important because I will not do the whole calculation. The important part is that it's small than something. And then you can figure out what the thing is to get a lower bound. So you compute F plus this plus some constant. So you're going to, you're willing to grow the dimension a bit on the F side, but you keep it under control. Exactly. So I will just do it again and again. So we will do it. It turns out that you need to do it about log n times or O of log n, log n times until the depth is less than n. And when the depth is less than n, you get another thing in the error term. So uh, let's just try write the final expression. The resulting ABP has size. So if we start with size s, let's say we finish with size at most s original size. It's actually, I mean, like we said, the, the way I presented it, it's S plus something small. It's not important. And computes F plus sum. Yeah, I'm sorry. I from one to K of a uh, PI prime times QI prime. So in each step you get more of these things. So you need to sum them up all together, but let's just index them in some way, plus some polynomial R, where, so here are the important parts, K will be at most something like uh, N over 100, uh, and the degree of R will be strictly less than N. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so so the good thing is to think about it as F plus 
let's write it in quotes, epsilon of x, where epsilon is this error term, where I measure the, the, how big is the error by this number, k. So the important part is to keep the error bounded from uh, uh, n over two. So, so let's just, let, let's just uh, state the actual lemma, the uh, extended lemma that we need, which says that if you do something like that, k is at least omega n like before, Ah, I used K for, um, I used K for too many things. So let's do it, call it W now. So if. Could be a kappa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the point is that if F plus some uh, PI prime times QI prime plus R equals sum of a, uh, Okay, let's call it G and H now. J goes from one to W. And again, we have the conditions that PI prime, QI prime are constant free. Degree of R is less than N. Then W is omega of n. Oh, and the, and the number of uh, i's is at most uh, n over a hundred. So there are parts of it that are very easy to generalize from the previous thing, right? This n over hundred thing is not an issue. You just move them to the other side. And now instead of a lower bound on W, you have a lower bound on W plus n over hundred. But if, that, if, if this is at least n over two, then clearly w is omega of n. This is very easy. Uh, the constant free part, we also talked about it. It's very, I mean, we don't really need homogeneous. What we need is constant free. Uh, the only issue is maybe to say that uh, this, uh, uh, so we call that f uh, is uh, some xi to the n that, uh, so the fact that you need is that the singular locus of sum xi to the n plus r, this thing has dimension zero for every r of, uh, of degree less than n. And uh, yeah, okay, I mean, we'll not prove it, but it's not, it's not hard to prove. Uh, You want to say something, or is just uh, okay? Yeah, we'll say we are uh, calculation, think. or like you know. I mean, it's a, it's a very easy. I mean, uh, okay, let's take a derivative, right? So again, we if we take a derivative, we get something like with respect to x j. The you get something like uh, this thing plus the derivative of r equals zero. And now let's look at the variety of those things. So the point is that on this variety, basically whenever you have a polynomial on this variety, you can replace any power of xj, which is larger than n minus one by a lower, lower degree polynomial. Modul, I mean, just on this variety, right? Because this equals minus this. So the point is that every polynomial function on this variety has degree at most n minus one. And then it means that this is a finite set, this variety. It's, uh, I mean, it's easier dimension thing to do. Mm. Yeah, this is the entire proof. Oh, yeah. okay. Maybe I should say another, another thing is that another way to extend this lemma is that this lemma is also, also true for elementary symmetric polynomial. Uh, let's say the degree is n over four. Here, of course, we need R to, to uh, I mean, R cannot have degree larger than, than F because otherwise it's clearly not true. So the, here you need the degree of R to be less, strictly less than N over four. Uh, this, this, is the, this requires a calculation. Again, it's not uh, difficult, but this requires calculating the singular locus of elementary symmetric polynomial, which is um, uh, uh, not extremely difficult, but uh, let's not do it. Uh, 
anyway, yeah, I didn't do the calculation, but basically uh, this is what you do for ABP. I didn't talk about formulas, but for formulas, you do a very similar thing, right? Formulas also have this property that you can always find something, some node of intermediate degree. Uh, because we have those extra uh, 10 minutes, let, let me show you actually how you compute the elementary symmetric polynomial. I think it's a nice thing to see if you've never seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, maybe just say similarly, we get omega n squared lower bound for formulas. And uh, here is a theorem. This is not something new, by the way. It's very old, but uh, but let's uh, do it. It's nice. It's it's usually uh, attributed to Ben Or, but uh, I, I think this was known to Strassen because his early papers contain something which is extremely similar to this, and that uh, sigma n d has formula of size order n squared for all d, for every d. Notice that, I mean, let's, let's define this. Why, why is it non-trivial? I mean, this polynomial has, uh, I mean, when d is uh, n over two, for example, this polynomial has exponentially many monomials, right? So if you try to compute it, If you try to compute it in the natural way of just summing up the monomials, you will need exponentially many uh, 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 exponential size circuit, right? Each monomial, each monomial you can of course do with a small circuit, but you have exponentially many monomials. So if you try to do it just by summing the monomials, you will get exponential size circuit, but it turns out you can do it in size n squared and even in depth three, which is maybe even more surprising if you remember that in the Boolean world, functions like majority for symmetric functions like majority require exponential size circuit. But, uh, but this is not the case for uh, elementary symmetric polynomial. So, uh, so let's do it. It's, I, I mean, I'm only doing it because it's a nice thing to see and it shows one strength of algebraic computation and maybe why it's non trivial to prove lower bounds, like what clever things can you do? Uh, and the way to do it is the following let's define a new polynomial. P of t, or maybe let's call it, it will be, there is some distinguished variable t and, or maybe let's, let's call it y and new n variables x1 to xn. And it's just the polynomial product i goes from one to n of y plus xi. This is, a, this is certainly an easy polynomial to compute with, with a circuit of size O of N. Uh, and, but the point is that when you expand it, what do you get? Maybe, maybe it would be easier if I, if I write it like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, you already see it. So what will be the coefficient of Y to the D? Well, any way to pick D times I from these parentheses will give you uh, multilinear monomial of degree n minus d, the complementary uh, set. So this is just sum d goes from zero to n of y to the d times sigma n, n minus d. Right, the, the coefficient, this is a easy polynomial to compute and the, all the symmetric polynomials are somehow encoded in its coefficient, in co coefficients. But now the point is that uh, let's think of it as a polynomial in a variable y over the field where we adjoin, uh, so we, the field of rational functions in x1 to xn. And the point is that you can interpolate polynomial. Uh, let's say we are over c, so the field is large enough and there are no issues. If, if you get n evaluation of this polynomial, you can interpolate each coefficient and what is interpolation? Interpolation is just taking uh, some, linear, uh, uh, some linear functions of the evaluations, right? Evaluating polynomial at n point is multiplying by van der Monde matrix. This is a function that takes coefficients to evaluation. Uh, so the inverse of the van der Monde matrix, which is, uh, you can write it down. I mean, it's, uh, but it's in principle, it's not important. What are the coefficients? 
I mean, anyway, the point is that given, let's say we evaluate at, this is a degree n polynomial. So we need to evaluate at n plus one point. So let's say we evaluate p of zero, p of one to p of n. So given those values, there are some constants, a, a alpha one, a, sorry, alpha zero to alpha n in C. These constants are again, just given by the, the right row in the inverse of the Van der Mond matrix that corresponds to, to uh, those values. Uh, so there are those constants such that sigma d equals sum alpha i p evaluated at, uh, yeah, okay, I, yeah, 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 I somehow messed up the notation. When I write p of zero, I mean, uh, when you think of p as a univariate polynomial and the coefficients can be variable. So this is p of zero x1 through xn. But anyway, the point is that uh, this thing now defines the formula, right? Basically what you need to do is to compute, uh, you have a formula. Okay, you can probably see it at this point, but let's draw it anyway. You have a formula computing P of zero, which is just uh, taking this polynomial and plugging in Y equals zero. And you have a formula computing P of N. So these are formulas are usually triangles, right? So this is a N plus one sub formulas, each size O of N. And then you just need to take some linear combination of them, right? So, so usually linear combination, it's convenient to not worry about multiplication by scalar and just allow to, to multiply by scalars on the edges. Anyway, this is the entire formula. So uh, yeah, the point was that uh, uh, this is a way to compute each symmetric polynomial uh, using a polynomial size of uh, n squared size formulas. And uh, we prove now that uh, that this is tight even for general formulas. This is, ah, this is right, this is depth two. And this, this whole thing is now depth three. Uh, yeah, so this is a, this is a way to compute elementary symmetric polynomials and, uh, and um, and it turns out this is, at least for formulas, this is the optimal way. Uh, in, even for ABPs, again, for circuit, you can, uh, you can do slightly better things. Uh -huh. All right, I think I've run out of things I wanted to say. So now if there are questions. Uh... This is very neat. I mean, this trick of somehow extracting the coefficients by interpolation, I mean, it's... Uh... Right, yeah, so this is why algebraic circuits are somehow um, it's uh, it's always surprising the clever things that they can do, and maybe just explain why it's hard to pull over bound. I guess one question is like how much of so how how like um, how much do you depend on the field? If I like prefer to work in say finite fields, or like how much of this crashes and how much of it survives, and does it just things turn false or they just get messier or like or some uh, questions okay. don't make sense or. Uh, yes, so uh, there isn't a lot of, of dependence on the field for many things that I say. The only issue, I mean, let's let's again come back to this polynomial sum of xi, uh, sum of xi to the end, where things are simple. The only thing that uh, goes wrong over a finite field is that we have this partial derivative, which was n times xj to the n minus one. And if n equals zero, this is a problem. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not surprising that it's a problem, right? Because for example, if n equals p, then, then this thing equals, uh, I mean, maybe I should write it. Uh, I mean, sum of xi to the p is of course, sum of xi to the p over characteristic p. So of course you can write it, I mean, uh, you can write it as products of two things that, that are constant free. So 
in, in for some cases this is true but this is simply false but the point is that usually the way it works is that you pick the field and now you you know you 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 committed to some p so and now i just need to find a sequence of hard polynomials and this is easy because i will just pick those where n doesn't divide p and then everything works okay. for elementary symmetric polynomial it's uh, also the same thing happens. The singular locus doesn't behave, uh, again in quotes, as it should over a finite character characteristic. I, I, uh, I don't really know an easy solution for that. Uh, I mean, I was, uh, I wanted to, uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I never had time to check. Uh, one thing maybe I should also say about finite fields and elementary symmetric polynomials is that even here you can see that I needed n plus one elements in the field to interpolate. If the field is smaller, I don't know how to do it. Fair enough. Hi. Hi, Emil. If, if, um, just about the last, I had a question, but just about the last comment. Um, so you can always imagine that a field, so if you can make the field larger by a mental experiment, you sort of imagine that instead of a single coordinate, you have 10 coordinates, and then this multiplication is multiplying matrices. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, right. you have a paper with Pavel that uh, does it, right? Yeah, so you can do something. Uh, All right, yes. And, but, uh, but I had a question I wanted to ask. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, if I understood correctly, um, the lower bound you proved uses the fact that uh, a perturbation of the target function is also hard in some sense. Uh, right, right. Mm -hmm. So you took the target and perturbed it a little bit and it's still uh, the dimension is zero. And so one question is, can you now go, did you try to go back to uh, Kalokoti's proof and see if this property, which is stronger than what is used there, can improve the, uh, the lower bound? A question. <laughs> I don't uh, yes, I, I mean, uh, so I, it would be hard for me to imagine. Kalokoti is, is counting sub functions in some, uh, I mean, in some sense. It's uh, again, it's not really counting, but you mm -hmm. can actually phrase it as counting, uh, which seems to be hard for perturbation. But again, another thing is that for the Chipurk method, you can just prove that this thing cannot prove anything better than n squared over log n. So yeah, yeah so the, the second part of this question is, do you have a Boolean anal analog or can you have some like even just a vague Boolean analog of this property, which is some perturbation of the target function is hard always. Uh, right, yeah, so this is what, I, I am not sure how to uh, uh, state for Boolean functions. Uh, even if we look at Boolean functions that are arithmetic in a sense, let's say we want to compute with XOR and AND, which are like addition and uh, multiplication over F2, uh, it seems hard to, I mean, well, maybe it's not hard. I couldn't find a way to do it. I guess the issue is, I mean, yeah, this notion of perturbation is weird. It's just something that came up the way we analyzed it, but it's not, seems like, like standard way of measuring the distance between two things. So the way I, I understood what you described, so, if you repeat the process that you explain to us more times until you drop below to degree one, or sort of, you stopped when the depth became n. Right. 
you could keep going, yes. the cost of this would be a factor of log n in the lower bound, if I understood correctly. Uh, no, I don't think this will, this will cost you more. Uh, I think it will. I mean, the correct way to analyze it is using this, uh, uh, it has this geometric uh, sequence of how many vertices you uh, decrease in each size. It's, it's a bit hard for me to, uh, I mean, I guess the point I is that if-, if But I, as I understand what you, I think yes. I understand what you <laughs> But as far as I see, I didn't also write it down, but as far as I see, it will cost a factor of log n. If, but it's a, it's a very vague uh, thought. Hey. Okay, I think, I mean, I think there's a way to avoid this log n. And, and then you could, why don't you go to degree zero? Uh, I, In my mind, I, this is the reason, but uh, okay. But so now I, I, it was a part of the quest. So what I wanted to ask, so potentially instead of changing the so Kalokoti's proof or Chipuk go does a partition the whole way or does some structure the whole way. You sort of stop before you finish and are still able to argue something. So, so is this a place where you can gain? A, or, uh, yeah, I guess I don't have a good answer except by saying it's a, it's a, I mean, anything that is related to improving the chip work uh, is a good uh, question. Uh, I mean, there are other models. Well, I know of another a single, <laughs> another example where uh, in the algebraic world, we can improve over what the chip work gives for the Boolean model. And for the Boolean model, the Chipotle is the best thing that exists. Uh, but I don't, yeah, what I'm very interested in and I don't know how to do is finding a way to use those algebraic ideas to improve uh, the Boolean lower bounds beyond the Chipotle. Uh, yeah, you, you, you uh, make good points, but I don't have good answers, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. And uh, I had a question. So you, so I don't know much about this, this uh, area, but you mentioned, okay, there was this n squared over log n uh, barrier for, for the other method. Uh, for the method you described, is there any barrier? Like, do you know of an n squared barrier or? I mean, the only concerning thing is that for the polynomials we proved, which seem to be the best in some sense for this method, there's an upper bound of n squared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, kind of concerning. Uh, uh, I guess it also depends what you mean by the method, but like I said, if you just want to analyze some of balanced products, some of pj times qj, then existentially most polynomials have an exponential of and not the polynomials we have, but most polynomials. So, uh, yeah, it's not really a method saying that this is what you need to do, but uh, at least uh, that part, uh, uh, n is uh, the, the lower one you can prove is n, but we expect uh, much. I mean, I don't see, I mean, well, it's hard to prove lower bounds, but I don't know why it's so hard. <laughs> but, and do you have like, candidates for proving uh, larger than n squared lower bound? It, well, permanent is always a candidate just because it probably requires exponential uh, lower bound. Uh, but may maybe even something that has a upper bound of n cubed, but not of n squared or something. Right. Uh, I have to think about the other polynomials we know like 10 polynomials, right? So if not permanent, maybe determinant. Uh, I don't know what's the upper bound for the determinant. And it's also confusing because the determinant has n squared variables, which is always annoying when you prove those polynomial lower bounds. Uh, so, uh, 
Yeah, I don't uh, have. Uh, yeah, I don't have a candidates for uh, things. In many cases, just let me just say this. In many cases, uh, you first have the method, and then you come up with some polynomials that uh, that um, satisfy these lower bounds, that they, they satisfy the properties that you need. So maybe that mm -hmm. thing, some contrived thing that is tailored to the technique, maybe that could work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. This was, uh, was really nice. Thank you. So uh, on behalf of the audience, I do the <laughs> Zoom round of applause. Um, um, yeah, this was great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Have a good day.